Hello and welcome to Rise of Humanity. I'm your host, Chris Karamaya, and today I'm joined by my guest, David Whitehead. David is a martial arts instructor, instructor, entrepreneur, and founder of the podcast, The Way of the Truth Warrior, a show exploring philosophy, martial arts, personal development, and consciousness. David works passionately to help people empower themselves, align in mind, body, and spirit, and release the warrior within themselves, all to ultimately bring positive change to the world. So David, it's great to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for being here. Chris, it's an honor. Thanks for reaching out. And wow, great job on that intro, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. Uh, I've been there. Uh, I've checked out quite a bit of your work. Um, and I really enjoyed it. So yeah, I've got plenty to talk about today. <laughs> oh, great. That's awesome. I appreciate that. No problem. Um, uh, just to begin with, um, so you're a uh, piano player. I watched your rendition of Moonlight Sonata. That was pretty cool. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, I've been sort of unofficially a piano player i I've, i don't read music i play by ear it was always something that was more of a passion for me growing up kind of helped me stay centered and i loved just tinkering away on the thing until i figured out a little bit of it and now i just do it uh, just sort of as a uh, you know as a hobby and who knows maybe in the future i'll get into releasing some of it but it's just something that for me is one of my personal development tools i love music I think everybody should learn how to play some kind of instrument or learn how to sing. Um, I, I, my my two daughters, they love getting on the keyboard with me and tinkering around. So uh, if you have children out there, I think they should also get involved in music. It's it's quite a, a good uh, discipline and a spiritual practice in a way to, to get into. Yeah, that's awesome because I'm a uh, musician as well. And I've, um, I've had piano lessons and drum lessons over the years when I was quite young. But um, piano is just something that I just picked up. Um, and just start tinkering like you did, and um, that's event- awesome. Yeah, and eventually start writing all my own like songs on piano, and I got to the point where I could I could play like enough chords and be comfortable enough to start writing some really uh, really cool music. And uh, yeah, definitely agree. I mean, the the discipline aspect is great, especially piano, I think, and but also the um, the songwriting aspect is definitely a spiritual experience. That I found it's quite. Um, it's been quite kind of cathartic and looking back over the years um looking at some of the songs i've written has been uh, definitely you can see that it's a reflection of of who you are and it's quite interesting to look back did you say you you dabbled in songwriting um well not really songwriting i just i play around with different riffs and then i like i'll pick a chord and i'll just tinker around with it and then i'll work on something and i'll build it it's kind of like sitting down with some play-doh or something and just trying to sculpt something together and i love that process i love just like i love playing other songs that i enjoy like you know popular songs or different classical pieces but i really really enjoy just taking maybe a, a tone or a chord that i heard somewhere or that i was just playing around and randomly came across and then just building off it and it becomes sort of like a little creative project you know yeah that's pretty cool um so yeah i've um checked out um, quite a lot of your work and you've got this huge um huge warrior philosophy which is um i mean it's so um encompassing and it seems like you've put a lot of work into it i mean just to just to start digging into that what does the warrior philosophy uh, mean to you yes this was something that i discovered on my own sort of journey through studying the martial arts i always grew up interested in martial arts uh, I anything that I could get my hands on as a kid you can ask my parents like I was literally obsessed even from the age of nine years old um, and I went down to an, a local exhibition at one of the uh, there was a local event in the town that I was in I went down to the exhibition place and there was martial art demonstrations there they had karate demonstrations and judo demonstrations and it just something about it really really struck me and but at the time my parents didn't really want me to get into it because their perception of it was that it might be violent or it might not be good for me. You know, they're just looking out for my best interest. But Mm -hmm. I knew deep down that this was something I had to do. So I went and snuck down to the library and started taking out all the books I possibly could on the subject and even looking at the history. And I love digging into the back sections of those books where they talk about the, you know, the, the, the real goodies, the philosophy, the history, the mindset, because I knew it couldn't just be a bunch of magical looking movements that these people could do it it had there was something about their air of confidence there was something about um just 
the way they moved, the way they spoke to you, the eye contact, just the level of, it wasn't arrogance, but it was definitely a, a sort of humble confidence. And I, I desperately wanted that. I was a small, scrawny little kid. And uh, I, I really wanted to, to get into something that would help empower me. And so I went on that journey. And as I was studying the books, I really started to see that there was a lot more behind the scenes when it came to this martial arts philosophy. And at the time, I was also really interested in like the medieval period for some reason. I've always been drawn to that, like the knights and, you know, all of these different periods of time where you had these warrior classes, uh, not all of it good, not all of it romantic whatsoever. But um, my perception when I was young and, and going through this was that, again, there was something that was there that was an element of our the deepest parts of what it is to be a human being. Um, obviously, if you think of us as just from a basic hunter gatherer survival sense of the word, uh, which I think there's a lot more to us than that. But if you just think from that perspective, you'll think of the fact that, of course, all cultures and civilizations needed to have some sort of mechanism in place for self defense and self preservation. Because obviously, you've, you know, even on a tribal setting, you have competing tribes, you have people coming in to take over territory. So you had to develop a warrior class, and you also had to have that whole philosophy embedded in your culture and in your society. So there was all kinds of writings from the Native American traditions to the ancient Celts and Druids to the, um, you know, the, you know, the knights and the, the samurai and going over to China, you have the history of, you know, the Shaolin and the monks and um, in, in India, even they had the Sikh warriors, you have all over the world, you have all these different warrior traditions. And I was so fascinated with uh, their code of ethics, with their philosophy, with their outlook on life, because these are people that would have been in harm's way constantly. So they would have had a totally different perspective on what it means to be human, what life is all about, than say your average scribe or priest class or local you know, guy writing some philosophy in some book somewhere. Mm -hmm. These were the people that were living life and death every single day. And um, so I picked up books like the Hakaguri, the Book of the Samurai, and uh, the Book of Five Rings. And I just, I delved into it as much as I could, got into Bruce Lee. And from all that research, and I never stopped, you know, I eventually started training martial arts. My parents finally let me go and, <laughs> and sign up at my local karate club. You know, they, uh, they saw that I was practicing anyways, and they didn't want me to kill myself or, or whatever. So they're like, okay, just for safety, we'll let you go train under a professional. And then they became my biggest fans because they saw how it changed me. It changed my character, changed my level of confidence. It got me focused on being healthy. You know, I had friends that were around me that were trying to get me to smoke cigarettes and drink with them and do all kinds of stuff. And mm -hmm. I was always like, no, no, I got to go to a tournament. I got to go train. You know, and it was something that kept me straight. So they loved it. And, um, and, and it's just, it was something that radically changed my life. And so I studied, I kept studying the physical elements of, of the martial arts and different different warrior concepts. And then I was constantly looking into the history and philosophy. So what I present today in the presentations I do and the show that I do and in this whole concept is what I've personally gathered and what my personal opinion is right now. And it, I mean, some of it might change tomorrow. Who knows? Because it's a constant evolution. But um, this is just what I've encountered. And I try to feature people on my show and on my website um, that come from different aspects of this tradition or at least even if they're not martial artists or from the warrior classes they are exemplifying these characteristics in what they're talking about and the whole point is about you know are you self-made or are you made by the herd are you made by the collective mm -hmm. and i think there might be a little bit of both going on there but for most people when you look at a philosophy like this um, even though yeah warriors you know they had to get together as a as a unit to be effective in military strategy the philosophy of it that goes beyond that is about per, it's, it's the ultimate personal development crash course. It is all about becoming self-sufficient, uh, gaining confidence and self-esteem, learning how to approach challenges, learning how to uh, face your fears, learning how to go places where people wouldn't normally go and no, being the one that stands up when everybody else around you cowers with fear. This is the, the warrior archetype if you want to give it that spin. So that's sort of a nutshell of where I'm coming from with that. Yeah, it's awesome. It's very, um, it's, it's a lot of depth to it. Um, I think, I mean, could you just, I mean, you mentioned a few there, but um, and some of the core qualities of what, of the warrior mindset. And I know a big one that I see cropping up a lot is um, 
this the idea of taking personal responsibility for your life and i think that's it's mm. such a, an empowering uh, state to be in to you know to realize that you can create your own reality and you're not subject necessarily depending on your your level of personal power to what's what's going out going on out there in the world is that a big part of the warrior mindset yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I think that's the core of it. Okay. You know, you could look at personal responsibility and the principle of justice as the main core, you know, and obviously if you look at courage, courage is something you need in order to uphold justice and in order to take personal responsibility. So the warrior archetype, which I believe every human being has this embedded in their the deepest layers of their consciousness, um, because at some point in time in history, your ancestors had to fight for their survival, be it on the side of some mountain somewhere, or be it in some village raid, or be it in some war period of war. Um, it's it's an element that's embedded in us. And uh, so what happens today, I find, is that because of the access to technology and everything is becoming, quote unquote, easier, where everybody wants quick fixes and, and you know, ideas are flying around really, really fast today. It's the information age. It's, it's, you don't go through that old process of really having to struggle in order to gain knowledge and insight or, uh, you know, to really develop as a person psychologically. So... There, this what we're trying to do with this kind of information is bring it back to people and say, look, you're not a victim in life. I mean, it looks like you might be. It looks like, oh, this is where I was born and these were my parents and these were my friends and this is what the media is telling us and that we can't control what's going on in the world. Uh, this is, you know, all of that is obvious that there are environmental things that contribute to the challenges you're going to face in life. But the, the question is, what are you going to do about it? Mm. Are you going to take your own personal responsibility? And I, when I say that, a lot of people, they email me, that they, they think I'm talking about, you know, taking some kind of self guilt trip or something <laughs> like that's not at all what I'm advocating. Personal responsibility is actually your personal power in a situation. If you take responsibility for your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, and hence the actions that you take in the world, um, then you suddenly are now an empowered being. You're not just you're not just lost at sea getting tossed around by the waves of life. You are actually someone that built a boat, that has a sail, that has some coordinates, and you know where you're going. And sometimes storms come, knocks the boat off course, and you have to work hard to struggle to get that boat pointing due north or wherever you're going, right? So this is what I feel um, is, is, has been missing in the education of children, um, we don't get a lot of media on these kind of concepts, although I guess you could look at some of the, you know, you got a lot of films and shows coming out about the superheroes, but they're highly romanticized. It's a lot of action and it just kind of distracts people from the true story of what the hero and what the warrior was as archetypes of our of our history and what, what that means to us as human beings today. So what I'm trying to do is draw from the past take the best parts of these philosophies because there are elements of it that I don't agree with from different, I mean, it, it differs across culture, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, you, you take the best of it and you say, how can we resurrect this archive of knowledge and how can it now benefit people on a day-to-day -day basis today? And that's the challenge of my work because it is challenging. And um, sometimes I feel like there aren't even enough words in the human language to uh, quantify it properly, but I'm trying to do my best with it. <laughs> Yeah, it's awesome. Um, yeah, personal responsibility. Yeah, it's definitely a big one that I um, I see cropping up and kind of just trying to uh, learn not to fall into that victim mindset. What are some of the? I mean, if you're dealing with someone who's struggling to step into their power and really create the life that they want, what do you see? What other things do you see that hold people back the most from doing what? what they uh, are really probably uh, capable of achieving. Self-doubt pops to mind right off the bat, you know, mm -hmm. just not having gained enough experience to learn how to have faith and trust in yourself. Um, and it's, there's an old sort of thing that I used to say in my mind when I was growing up, when I was younger, when I was in my youth and in my teens, I suffered from a great deal of depression and anxiety. And I, I know there's a lot of people out there suffering. And it just so happens, Chris, that we're talking today on October 10th, which is sort of World Mental Health Day. Yeah. And um, I just released a video on my YouTube channel uh, about this, where I was sharing some thoughts for people that might be struggling with this. And I feel like when we look at something like depression and anxiety and being someone that's experienced it, um, it's 
it's it's very deeply rooted in a feeling that you don't have any value, that you have nothing to give, that you're empty, that you're not connected to anything. You feel like you should be connected to something, but you're not. You feel very disconnected. Um, you feel very tortured inside that yeah, there's something eating away at you, but you kind of you, you can't always put a finger on it. And so the, these are little things that creep up as a result of what I would say is a deficiency somewhere. There's a deficiency in, in your mind, in your thinking patterns, in your experiences, and what you should be doing every day. And um, for some people, maybe they feel like, oh, well, it's just genetic. I'm just genetically destined to forever be a failure in life or I'm just I'm, I'm my life is predetermined for me um, and so I can't I don't really have any control over my thoughts feelings emotions and actions in the world so therefore I'm just gonna have to go go along to get along and when you're in that mindset how can you not feel depressed how can you not feel defeated right mm-hmm. and so when I look at the warrior literature the whole concept of victory and defeat and how to overcome adversity is very strong in it because obviously that's what it's all about. And um, I found that when I started training the martial arts, moving my body, changing my diet, getting thinking more healthy, thinking about my health, and also even studying what are the, what are the things that are getting in the way of my success in life. And for me, success is multifaceted. It's not just having a million dollars in a mansion on some you know hillside somewhere. It's a combination of your, you know, are, do you have time wealth? Do you have time freedom? Do you have the time in your life to think about these things, to do personal development, to uh, create a routine that works for you? Are you constantly working and building your life around everybody else and what they expect of you and the demands they put on you? Or are you able to be a self-creator? Are you able to manifest something for you? Um, and, and then, yeah, that could lead to the ability to create actual material physical wealth as well in your life Um, but it has to stem from a true place of integrity first or otherwise you're not even if you got all the money and material possessions and things in the world you still wouldn't find that happiness you know i I meet so many people that you call them successful quote unquote Mm -hmm. and they're manically depressed (laughs) how could that be how could that be if if the only thing that we're being sold every single day is to go out and make millions of dollars Um, but on the other hand i've met people that are very successful and they are the most healthy, happy, passionate, um, knowledgeable people I've ever met. So I think that it's no matter what the external circumstances of your life are, if you can get over that doubt that you feel, if you can get over that inner battle that we're all fighting, everybody's fighting. It's like that battle of two wolves story where we're all got two wolves inside of us. One wolf is the light wolf. It's the wolf that represents courage and, and, and love and compassion and health and vibrance and freedom and all the great qualities of humanity. And on the other side, you have the dark wolf, which represents doubt and uh, fear and, uh, you know, uh, the lack of empathy and, you know, all these ne- more negative elements of humanity. And those wolves are battling it out inside of us. And there was an old Cherokee story where the, this, they were telling this story to the young ones. And one of the kids puts his hands up and says, listen, well, you know, which wolf wins the fight? Which, which wolf is going to win this? And the elder says to him, it's the one you feed. Whatever wolf you feed the most, that's the one that's going to become the strong one. That's the one that's going to be victorious over the other wolf. So you got to ask yourself every single day, which wolf am I feeding? Which, where am I putting my attention? Um, if I don't have that confidence and I don't have that self-belief right now, can I accept that that's where I'm at? Can I be honest and have a truthful assessment of myself so that I can now know where I'm at, know where my coordinates are, and then start becoming solution-oriented and say, okay, I'm going to make little tiny steps every single day. I call it the 5% rule. I'm just going to change my diet and my health by 5%. I'm going to um, invest my money in be- things that are better and better for me and take money out of the things that aren't so good for me by a, a factor of 5%. You start with little tiny bites, little tiny steps, and you will see progress in the right direction, I can assure you. Yeah, that's awesome. And um, that, I suppose in a way that self-doubt kind of um, can tie back into the victim mentality and not, instead of just, you know, focusing on what's bad around you and blaming everything understanding that there is there can kind of be a war within as much as there is without and um i i watched your talk at the i think it was free your mind conference and one of the quotes you had in your uh, your uh, talk was if there is no enemy within the enemy 
outside can do you no harm. I think that's awesome. Yeah, it's one of my faves. I love that one. Yeah. That's a good one because yeah. it, it's true. It really is. I mean, I, well, to an extent. I mean, we do live in a real world where there, now we're involving other people, right? So there are people that, I mean, look at what just happened in Las Vegas. You know, who knows what really happened? But either way, it was a horrific tragedy. And these kinds of things happen every day all around the world. I mean, if you go to Chicago, uh, this is something that happens weekly over there. You know, you go to certain mm. places, right? Or you go to the Middle East or you go to Africa. or You, go, you know, there's there's horrible things that happen around the world that I think sometimes especially the young people getting online and starting to learn about this, um, they look at that and they're like, whoa, what kind of planet did I just get incarnated on? You know, like what the hell is <laughs> happening? And you start to feel very powerless. You can feel that. I felt that. I feel you. But here's the thing. As long as human beings have been on this planet, um, I think it was Leonard Schlein that said, you know, if you look at the history of humanity, you're looking at um, a history of, 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 soaking the blood of its creatures on this planet this planet is a blood-soaked earth you know so we're looking back and seeing that we've been fighting and killing and torturing each other since the advent of humanity pretty much um but don't don't take that as oh my god that's all we are because we've also had beethoven's we've had leonardo da vinci's we've had you know uh you know, you know all oh my god I'm, I'm almost i can't even name all the names there's so many names popping in my <laughs> head right so all the brilliant minds that have created amazing things have painted masterpieces that have never existed before we were just talking about piano and music musicians how does a musician create music that's never been heard before on the planet how does that happen if we're all just a bunch of mechanical robots with predestined uh, psychological determinism how the hell are we all creating unique expressions when we reach when we're able to go through this process of matriculation and we're able to eliminate these barriers you get the best brightest light that is i feel the best part of the human spirit so yeah we're capable of good and evil and we see good and evil around us in the world and the warrior in my opinion is that force that stands like the the immune system response to the parasites it's the one that stands up and says i will not tolerate injustice i won't tolerate it in my own life and my own dealings with other people i won't tolerate it from other people and i won't when i see it in the world yeah i'm gonna have a sort of a bit of righteous indignation you know i'm gonna have a little bit of, of of anger that comes from my inner humanity but i'm not gonna let that win i'm not gonna let that i'm not i'm not gonna become what I hate. I'm not going to become the fear that I have of what I see going on in the world. I'm not going to become this person or persons that went and shot up a bunch of people in Las Vegas. Just because I see that every day, I don't need to become that. I can stand for something else. I can shift my, my power and I can keep my power by taking back that personal responsibility. So then, of course, this discussion leads us into the field of morals and ethics and why they're important. You know, I, I, feel, I hear so many academics today talking about philosophy like it's a thing of the past. We don't need it anymore. We got to, it's the computer age now. We got computers. Well, you can't compute morality, my friend. And you can't, you can't compute Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I'm sorry. That's something that is unique to human consciousness. And so if you look at human consciousness like almost like we're, we're like prisms that are filtering and processing photonic light. And we're, re, we're, we're sort of if that lens, it gets dirty. You're not really projecting any light outwards into the world, are you? It's just hitting that dirty prism and not going anywhere. That's where a lot of people are. They're very toxic. They're, they're, they're very afraid. They're very unhealthy, even in their physical bodies. So what would you expect if you're missing the ability to clean that lens so that you can refract the light more efficiently and actually create something of beauty in the world? So to me, these kinds of sciences and art forms and disciplines and philosophies are the cleansing process. They're the ones that clean it up so that you can actually, that's what we, when we say potential, do you want to know how much potential you have? Did you know, you might feel lost in this big universe, but did you know that you're an emanation of that universe? You know, when you look at nature and you see both kind of like the, the, hor the horrific tragedy that's in nature, and you also see the brilliance and beauty in nature, do you know that you're a reflection of that? And that you're not just lost in some sea of oblivion, but that you are an integral part, a very important part. And I know that because I've also done a lot of research in the field of uh, looking at, you know, cellular biology and talking to some of the world's renowned cellular biologists that know what they're talking about. They look under a microscope and they would say the cells that make up your body, which are around anywhere from 80 to 100 trillion cells that make up you, okay, physically, 
each one of those cells is made up of how many atoms? And, on, and it just goes on infinitum, right? So we're in this big kaleidoscope of, of all this stuff that makes up who you are. And it's a, like a miniature universe inside of you. And if any one of those cells or genes or anything gets switched off or turned in the wrong direction, then it can throw off the entire balance of the system. So if you feel like you're just lost at sea with all these people running around and there's, you know, what, what kind of difference can I possibly make? Get that out of your head. You are an emanation of the universe. Just look up at the stars of night at night. That same light that refracts off the stars reflects within you. All the great religions and spiritual traditions of the past have told you that. And so you're an emanation of something greater than you can even imagine. But if you close off and say, nope, I'm just a hunk of meat. I'm just here to live and, you know, eat, sleep and then die, you know, like that's it. Well, then your life will be a reflection of that belief system and that worldview. So I'm here to try to encourage people to look deeper in the Kung Fu. They used to say, you know, look beyond the surface, see what is real in yourself and in others. This is the whole concept of go to the esoteric layers of your being and you watch, watch the magic happen. You know, don't, don't just listen to me. If I sound like some kind of weirdo or whatever, go and experiment with this, experiment with it. Cause the only way you'll know the truth about yourself and the world is if you can prove it to yourself to the point where it's undeniable. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so, um, how, how important do you find that um, self-esteem is in the warrior philosophy? Because I n noticed that you reference um, a book quite a lot in your in your videos, Six Pillars of Self-Esteem. What um, what kind of impact has that had on you, and what what have you implemented into your teachings from that? Oh man, you're awesome, Chris. I'm so glad you brought that up. <laughs> so, what 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 could be a more important topic? You know, I. I when I came across Nathaniel Brandon's work, I actually was recommended to read it by Michael Tessarian, who I co-host the Unslaved podcast with. Um, and for anybody okay. listening, if you want to check that out, you can go to unslaved.com. We've got a lot of shows on a variety of subjects. But he first said, you know what, you, you, you like this self-personal development stuff. You got to get into one of the greats. You got to read Nathaniel Brandon. So I said, oh, OK. And I went and picked up his book. I'm holding it in my hand right now. And this book radically changed my life in that moment. And the reason is, is because, you know, there's things that we know and there's things that you know deep inside of yourself that you can't always call to the surface of your mind. You know what I mean? So you probably had those moments where you have these sort of eureka moments where you either mm -hmm. see something or you see it in a movie or you see, you hear a quote or someone says something and you may have heard it a hundred times before, but the way they said it, completely brought something to the surface that you never had access to before. That was the experience I had with this man's work. And it, it was something I was always looking into. Um, but the way he conceptualizes it, the way he breaks it down in a very non fluffy way, like all the self, a lot of the self help personal development field today has been completely hijacked by, I feel like a lot of fakers who are just copying other people's work so that they can sell books in the New York times. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, fine. Good for you. But you're not really, again, coming with anything authentic and you're not referencing the greats that came before, which is sad. So people like Nathaniel Brandon, like he's one of the originals to do so much work. I think he's got like 12 or 13 books on just the topic of self-esteem alone. Wow. And, and so the, the concept is that the world we live in and the time we live in right now with all the socio-political chaos going on around you, it is a dangerous time to not know yourself, to not trust yourself and to not be aware, have any spatial awareness of your surroundings. It is a dangerous time to not have that. And so the entire, um, the entire concept of who you are is going to determine your worldview and it's going to determine your actions. So if you see a lot of people committing acts of violence and, and theft and murder and mayhem, and even at the, at the geopolitical level, you see a lot of psychopaths getting into power and steering the ship of state into God knows where directions. Well, where it, it, it all started once upon a time in that individual's life where they were completely disconnected from their authenticity, from their empathy, from their self-esteem. And it all started with their, the way they viewed themselves. So let's look at it like this. If you look at a sociopath or a psychopath or a murderer or a, th uh, you know, a thief or whatever, they would not be capable of stealing or killing or thieving or doing any of those things to other people if they had first not done those things to themselves. 
So there's this misconception out there that, you know, criminals are, um, they're very selfish. I think they're the opposite of selfish. And the selfish, the definition I'm using is when we're talking about the essence of the true self, right? So mm. being self-centered and all, you see all these words, they kind of turn them around to make you look like some kind of arrogant scumbag. Um, no, no, no. The people that are those narcissists, those, those criminals, the, the last thing they have any connection to is the true self. Okay. Mm -hmm. So self-esteem is not talking about I'm better than you. It's not talking about that. It's I'm better than I thought I was because I now know for a fact who I am. I'm not, I'm not taking a bunch of religious nonsense into my head and believing in something that I'm not, I can never be in an imperfection or whatever that would just never happen. I'm taking a realistic approach to understanding consciousness. And consciousness is talking about your awareness, your ability to perceive things around you. And we all, we have this gift, human beings, to do that. And if you don't know who the viewer, who's watching the watcher, right? Who's the real, who's perceiving the fact that you're perceiving? You know, you're able to think about meaning. The, 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 the wolf out in the woods is not thinking about meaning. It's, it's doing what it does. It has consciousness, but it has a different spectrum of consciousness than a human being does. So we're given this, this gift of uh, where we're able to actually analyze and we're able to make choices and say, well, I'm going to use that consciousness to do good things for myself, for my family, for my community and for the world, or I can do the other side of it, you know? So self-esteem is the, is the foundation upon which all that rests because if you don't have an accurate analysis of yourself, if you don't know how to, what the, so you can't just say, oh, now I believe in myself. I'm listening to this podcast right now. I'm going to decide to believe in myself. No, no. It starts with the decision to start the journey, but holy crap, it's not just going to happen magically. There's not an app for that. There's no self-esteem app that you can download. Um, I can tell you there's some, probably some good books you could download through a book app, but that's, that's different. Um, you would have to actually go through the process of being productive in your life. And being productive is very innately human. I mean, think about just surviving in the woods. If you're not productive, you're going to die, right? So product productivity in the modern world is essential to people. And productivity in something that you're passionate about, that you believe in, that you love, that you feel you're making an impact in, other, in your life and other people's lives, something that brings you joy. And if you're not doing that and being successful at it and working every day and going, hey, you know what? Uh, I started this project or I started doing this podcast or I started doing this piano and I've been failing. It hasn't really been sounding right. It hasn't really been matching what I've envisioned it to be. If you give up, your self-esteem goes through the floor because now you know deep down, even if you never said it consciously, you know subconsciously that you quit, that you gave up. When if all you needed to do was just keep pushing and keep practicing and keep making those mistakes and maybe actually going out and seeking mistakes so that you could get better, um, that's the magic that's going to build self-esteem because now you have perspective. You could go, I remember when I started playing the piano the first time and I used to suck and now I don't suck as much. And, <laughs> and then a couple years later, I suck even less. And then you get to the point where you even stop using the word suck and you go, you know what? I'm actually pretty good. And, and then, then society comes around and goes, oh, you think you're pretty good, eh? You must be some arrogant, uh, you think you're the world's gift to the, you know, God's gift to the world. Forget the people around you. If you believe in yourself, there has to be a, a balance of humility with that, you know, because you're not trying to say, I'm, I'm better than everybody else. You're just saying, I'm better than I was before. And I know that for a fact because I verified it, right? That's the difference. So there's a whole field of study. I couldn't recommend the book enough. Um, you can get uh, audio books of it online. Uh, you could you can buy it. You, I got it. You know, I walked into a used bookstore and I got this book for like five bucks. You know, and I was like, wow, they didn't even know what kind of gold they had. And th this is the kind of stuff that will, will change. It will change the world from the individual all the way up the fractal, I think. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, definitely, yeah, self-esteem, a big, uh, big part of the uh, philosophy. So, um, I mean, we've covered quite a bit of the warrior philosophy. So just kind of shifting gears to martial arts now. I mean, obviously, that's play played a big part in your development and I, from what I've gathered and what I've heard about martial arts it's a great discipline but also it's a powerful method for improvement maybe beyond those physical aspects um, 
maybe tapping into the the spiritual as well. I mean, is that something you found, and how do you see the the current state of the way that martial arts is is taught today? Yeah, well, martial arts is a is another tricky field because of the fact that you know it's you walk into a school up the road from you and you don't know if you're getting the true deal or not. Um, everybody has their perspective on it. There's as much infighting and disagreement in the martial arts as there is in all the religions of the world. So just so you know, I would always kind of leave that warning out there for people. But if you can get past all that, all that drama, um, you can find at the core of it something incredible. And I think it's completely unique from any other spiritual discipline. And it's even unique in the world of sports or even in the world of fitness. And the reason is, is because it's something where it's based on combat. And for people that might be more of the pacifist type that would say, well, I don't want to be studying violence and how to hurt people because, of course, that's just going to create more violence. You know, the truth about martial arts is that you're learning an art of self-defense. So martial arts could be summed up like this. It's, it's the science of movement and it's the art of self-defense, okay, or the art of movement, science of self-defense, however you want to play it. But the idea is that you're learning both a a scientific discipline and an artistic expression at the same time. And you're, you're using combat as the premise. But the combat you're actually learning, yes, in a practical, le- in a practical method, you could be learning some valuable, life-saving self-defense skills that every human being should know. You're walking in a world of other human beings. I, I live in uh, British Columbia. There are wild apex predators running around here, uh, you know, from bears to cougars to wolves to foxes to all this stuff, right? So, I mean, just having an awareness of what danger is, um, is, is key. In the arts that I study, like jujitsu and, and, and karate and many of these other martial arts, you also learn how to fall safely, how to roll safely, how to, you know, work on your balance, how to understand proper leverage and timing and technique and um, making sure your body's lined up properly when you're executing certain actions. Uh, So you're learning about movement in general as a human being. What is the most efficient way to move your body? And in that process, if anybody out there has got into the work of people like Wilhelm Reich and the concept of somatic intelligence and the mind-body connection, or even Bruce Lee talked about this stuff too, you'll see that when you're moving your body, you're actually moving and stimulating your mind and vice versa. So the whole point is that because it's centered around combat, it's a mirror for the combat that we're having within each and every one of us. It's not supposed to be just about what's the fastest way I can take out 10 guys in 10 seconds, you know? <laughs> like everybody wants that, okay? And maybe you'll start martial arts because of that's what got you. Watch some Jason Bourne stuff or whatever, or Jackie Chan movie, and you're like, hey, I want to do that stuff. Hey, that's fine. That's You're going to get in the door. But um, when you get to the higher levels of martial arts, you'll start to realize that fighting is the last thing you want to do. Um, you're not going to want to fight on the street. It's not glorious. I've done it. It's not, you don't, it's not what you think it is. Um, I enjoy sparring though. I enjoy fighting with my friends and my, my, the people I train with, and we push each other to the limit because we understand the value of having someone put fire on you, having someone put some heat on you. You know, um, we walk around very comfortable every single day. We're not, we're not attacked on the street daily like maybe we used to be Uh, you're not going to the bus stop and worried about some jaguar jumping out of the bushes and dragging you off Um, we mostly get things pretty easy for the most part today and isn't it funny that as a result we see records of depression and all this stuff skyrocket it's as if human beings need opposition we need it we need we need some kind of oppositional force in order to grow. If we don't, if everything's just, every comfort is given to us and we never have any challenges to overcome, um, then we're not going to grow. I mean, for crying out loud, even the movies and shows we watch when we're in our relaxation or entertainment time of the day, we watch people facing obstacles and protagonists and antagonists fighting it out and dueling it out. Like we can't even get enough of this. And so I think what happens is with martial arts, you get an arena where you get to physically do this in a safe way where there's no violence or aggression uh, being used in in the training. Um, You're actually training a discipline on how to stop that. I talk to the kids all the time that I teach and I say, you're not learning how to fight in here. You're learning how to stop fights. That's what you're learning. And you're also learning how to win the internal fight, the fight that maybe you doubt yourself or you don't, you think you don't look good enough and you, people are making fun of you. That's a fight. You know, when you come to the mat and you can, you're a scrawny little accountant and you're rolling around with some like, 
uh, police officer or or some lawyer or something like that. And it's none of that stuff matters on the mat. You're both just two human beings and it's the best man wins. Um, that little accountant can win the day. And that kind of it doesn't matter what the social status is in those environments. So it's it's something very pure. And it's not about just hurting people. It's about learning about how to survive, learning how to grow under under combat tested pressure. Um, and that's that's a totally different thing. And that's why I think it's unique. Um, because if you're just sitting in some lotus position doing yoga poses or whatever, that's great. But it's limited in how it can reach you and actually make you strong actually physically strong, mentally strong, spiritually strong. And looking around at, you know, looking at all these social justice warriors running around that don't have a clue about what they're really fighting against, um, kids coming out of school that aren't really educated on, you know, how things came to be in the world and they're just shouting and screaming and defecating in the streets and doing ridiculous stuff out there. You're like, you you just, you you haven't been tested. You haven't been given enough challenge to actually realize what it takes to create something in the world yet. And I used to be one of those people too, so I'm not trying to knock anybody. But eventually I grew up and I grew up because of martial arts and I'm eternally grateful for the lessons I've learned because they've saved my life uh, in real life scenarios more than once and they've saved my life spiritually and emotionally as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I love what you said about we need opposition to grow because I kind of think in a way that's really what what the world is about it's almost it, i mean it's like a training ground and it's trial by fire and you have to overcome and face like massive challenges if you want to have the most growth and i think people under that kind of that fear mindset was you know i need to hide away from everything but they're missing the the bigger picture that if you don't do those things and you won't grow and it's um it's made me think of because i um interviewed a entrepreneur on my show a few weeks ago and um mm -hmm. He actually went to, he was sued by a, a major corporation. And uh, during that, the court case, he got sent to prison for contempt of court because he wasn't going along with proceedings. And uh -huh. he um, went to one of the most violent prisons in the UK for four months. And he basically, I mean, he, it was difficult, but he turned it into a personal development um, opportunity. <laughs> Good for and him. He, and he, he absolutely, like, he was just like it was just incredible and he wrote journals on it and he said you know this i've been he and he's a coach as well as an entrepreneur a personal development coach and he said this is a time for me to roll up my sleeves and find out you know if uh, if everything that i've been teaching over the years really works he's like i'm not on stage now i'm not in front of a camera this is you know there's no second takes this is the real thing and right. uh, i just yeah and when you said opposition we need that to grow it just it made me think of that and how you know you really need to take on those challenges to to uh, to grow oh yeah brilliant story and i would i would recommend to people listening you know when we say seeking adversity uh that doesn't mean you need to go to your local bar and start mouthing off to some biker gang it just means you need to take a different mindset uh when you're approaching the challenges that i know you're already got going on everybody out there you got your own challenges going on in your life okay so use those like that gentleman did in some extreme scenario like that in a prison use those experiences in your life as a personal development tool and use it as a test. Try to be a little more objective with yourself. Go, okay, okay, here I am. And uh, I'm all worried and got my stomach's in knots and I got all this stress and anxiety going on about all this stuff I got to do. But instead of dwelling in it, why don't I just separate from it for a minute and look at it objectively and say, okay, what would I do in this scenario if I wasn't all worried and fretting and biting my nails about it? What would I actually do if I could just be in my most powerful place? Think of a time in your life where you almost felt invincible for a moment, just for a moment. I know you've had at least one fleeting moment where you felt like everything was flowing brilliantly uh, in whatever you were doing. You, you, you had good energy that day. You felt almost like an electric charge in your body. You, you just looked every, you looked that person in the eyes and you said something bold or, you know, there's a moment we've all had and think of that moment and, and really, you know what, even write that moment down. And then when, if it ever happens again, write that moment down, make that a part of your diary, make that a part of your process so that you're, you, you're, you're actually documenting the times where, you actually grew your spine and rose up and became the best of yourself. Because if your goal is to discover the best of yourself and achieve your potential, be it in a relationship, in your personal life, in a business, in whatever you're doing, um, you need to have some kind of case study that you're capable of doing it. And I think many times 
Like if you're walking down the street and all day everybody's like, hey, you look great. Nice jacket. Oh, now look at those new shoes. Hey, I saw you on this. You were awesome. Blah, blah, blah. And then one person that day says some off-color comment to you or shuts you down or makes fun of you and laughs at you. Just one person. Which one are you going to go to bed thinking about? It's going to be the latter, isn't it? Right? Mm-hmm. It's just the way we're wired. And so you, instead of recording probably probably you you're you're uh, connected to your internal power more than more often than not actually you probably just don't even think about it it's just that we tend to focus on the negative things in our lives and then be- we start to believe we develop a belief system that that is the uh, that's our life that's that's the experience in my life and when you talk to your friends you reinforce that and you go yeah this really crappy day today my boss came down to me really hard or I had this argument with my wife or my friend or whatever um, and and when you talk to people you tend to tell them the dark the negative things that happen to you in your day and what's crazy man this is do a little experiment go start talking to people about the awesome experiences you had that day and just watch how they're just like, who does this guy think he is? Or who does this girl think he is? There's, look at how much of an epidemic this is, okay? So just, you don't, you don't have to believe me, just do some experimenting. And the other thing I was going to say was that uh, I had a little story about what really switched me on. Um, I, was, I was young and I was, I was going through a really tough time. I was kind of depressed and I wasn't sure what my place was. And I was even struggling with the question of martial arts and why are we even doing it? And is it moral? And what, what's, is it good for us? I didn't know as much as I did. And I was at a workshop. It was actually an event where you would train the whole weekend um, and every, every day you did 40 minutes with a different instructor. So you're on one mat training Cali stick fighting, then the next moment you're learning knife fighting, then the next moment you're with some Shaolin monk learning how to, you know, balance on the tip of a spear. And then another minute you're doing backflips with some gymnastics coach. Like it was just a fun workshop we used to do. And um, nobody was talking about the philosophy of these, of the arts. It was just all just action packed stuff, which is great. But there was one Aikido master there that for his set, he was teaching some techniques and then he was relating them to life. So all the moves he was showing, he had some kind of, you know, Zen cone for us, you know, and I was just like, wow, this is really cool. So afterwards, I went up to him and I'm like, hey, sensei, could I ask a question? He's like, sure. I'm like, what is the true meaning and purpose of martial arts? What's the meaning of life? Like, what, aside from our self-defense and our training, what are we doing this for? And then it all just came out of me. I'm like, why are we here? What, what's life? And I started, and he's like, he looks at me and he's just like, hey, listen, the way I see it, the planet Earth is kind of like a dojo, right? Like and a dojo in Japanese just means hall of training, okay? A, a hall of development. And he's like, in this life, you need two things. One, you need the truth to be present and aware and, and relevant to your life. So you need the truth to be present in your personal life and in the interactions you have with, the other, with other people. And two, you're going to need to grow the spine of a warrior in order to realize and express that truth. And so right away, and to even, even to discover it, he's like, even to just discover truth, like you need to have some courage. So that's what martial arts is really about. And that's the purpose of life. And I was just sitting there like, oh my God. And in that moment, I remember, I remember my heartbeat wrote, came up. I felt like I took off a, like a heavy lead jacket or something just in that moment. Like I just kind of went, oh just one one sensei that I don't even know. I've never seen him since. He just came in and he answered this question for me and he has no idea how radically uh, he, he had changed my mind in that moment and it changed the track of everything I was looking at. All of a sudden, different kind of books were dropping off the shelf. Different people were coming into my life. I started with that premise and from that premise, my life completely transformed. So never underestimate the power of your words. Never underestimate the, the type of influence that you absolutely can have, whether it's on a young person or an old person, by, by uh, just talking or having a conversation and looking them in the eyes. Maybe it's not always going to be on Skype or whatever or on Facebook. Maybe just a, a real conversation, you know, or maybe you are just making a post one day on your Facebook page and people message you and they're like, oh my God, I read that and it changed my life. I get people that do that all the time. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> you know, so mm. don't underestimate the impact that you can have. Yeah, that's awesome. Really cool. Um, and I mean, you mentioned about the philosophy of martial arts there. I mean, you, I imagine you've studied lots of different martial arts and you always hear these stories of people arguing 
which one's best. I mean, have you, and then Bruce Lee kind of went and started his own style of martial arts. I mean, have you created your own kind of overarching like philosophy of putting them all together? I mean, what's your take on that? Yeah, I would say that I absolutely have. I just didn't want to give it a name and start a curriculum and start this whole cult following of people. Like, I didn't want to be like, I just started a new martial art. I didn't want to do that. And you know what? Bruce Lee didn't want to do that either. It just kind of happened. Um, what what I, I definitely agreed with him when he said, you know what? I just, I don't really believe in styles anymore, you know? And he got so much flack for saying that um, because he was just spitting in the face of all the tradition of the Eastern martial arts. And then in the West, people hated it. People hated him even more because he was so popular. This Asian man was just getting, he was getting more popular than the top uh, movie stars of the day. And he's out there saying stuff like this. Like he's, he's just like, yeah, we don't need to believe in styles. You don't need fixed stances and positions anymore. You just, it's the art of human movement. So you're going to take from one martial art and take from another and discard the rest, right? You're going to take what you feel works for you. And whereas all the traditionalists were like, no, there is a set cookie cutter, set of principles that you need to follow and techniques you need to train every single day and katas and fixed positions and blah, 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 blah. That kind of reminds me of the education system and even the mainstream scientific community right now to a large degree. And then you have the other side of it. So Bruce Lee said this, he goes, well, in order to approach martial arts correctly, you can't be in a state of imbalance. So on one side, if you're too analytical and you're only scientific, then you'll miss out on being able to activate your true power, which comes from your uh, form of expression, right? But if on the other side, you're up in woo-woo land and you, you're just, you're not practicing anything and you're not verifying anything, then you're unscientific in what you're doing and you're not able to prove it in practical reality. So you're in another state of imbalance. So the truth lies in the middle. Hey, where did we hear that before? That's an old saying we hear constantly, the truth lies in the middle. Well, what, what that's saying is that the truth is something that resolves conflict. And so you, I was talking about this in one of my recent shows where it was like you have two hemispheres of your brain. You have the left hemisphere, you have the right hemisphere, you have the corpus callosum and all of that that connects the two together. So if your thinking regularly becomes mostly analytical and only um, using the logical left brain processes of the brain, then it can become left brain dominant. And what does that do? That throws your whole system off into a, a state of imbalance. And that even produces, they've done all kinds of uh, MRIs and CAT scans, all this research to show that that produces psychotic behavior, that produces um, uh, all kinds of uh, mental health issues, etc. And the same is true if you're extremely right brain leaning, where you get into the whole spiritualist cults and you fall for pretty much everything the preacher on the stage says to you. And you're, you're, you know, you're at a Tony Robbins event every friggin' weekend. And you're just like, you're completely immersed in only the creative side to the point where you're not even connected to reality anymore. So the truth that I saw as in martial arts was that you should have your feet planted firmly on the ground and have your head in the clouds simultaneously. You can't be one without the other because that's the two forces, the yin yang, the masculine and feminine that make up your entire being. So balance is the key. And if you want to play with balance as a concept, just go and walk on a, on a plank or on a fence or something where you actually have to struggle for balance. And it's, it's a struggle, but if you keep practicing, you get better at it. And I think the same thing is true with your thinking and the same thing would be true with how you approach martial arts. So that long winded explanation is to sort of bring you the way I see martial arts today, which is that, um, there are many amazing martial artists out there that are, are doing this. Um, even in the world of mixed martial arts and jujitsu and competition and karate competition and kickboxing, you'll see um, the odd champion come out. And the reason they're beating everybody is because the fact that they've balanced their movements, their timing, their speed, their precision, their they've balanced the system out so well that they can beat world-class athletes and make them look like they're beginners. And I'm just using that. That's the scientific test that, you know, as a physical martial artist, they've nailed it. But then you hear them and you do interviews with them and they're, man, these people are, they're, they're deep thinkers. They, they do their research. They understand a lot of the principles behind what they're doing. Um, and they're rare, but those are the people I feel like really, really got it. They've got a good balance of, of a good head on their shoulders and their body is tuned properly. So um, there is no style. It, that's an illusion. You, there, you, you have you have a body. You have two of everything, right? You got two hands, two arms, two legs, two eyes, two lips, two nostrils, la 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 la, two hemispheres of the brain. 
So as a human being, your body is a specific, unique um, expression of humanity. And you also probably have your own physical challenges that you have to overcome. If you got a bad back somewhere, you broke your ankle in high school or something like that. Or, uh, or maybe you even have your own mental challenges where certain concepts just don't make sense to you no matter how much you practice them. So how can you take one template and apply that to everybody in a general sense? That's what the education system does, and that's why it's not working. So the real way of learning anything is to find out, okay, here's my strengths and weaknesses. Here's the way I think. Here's the way my body moves. Um, I hear what that instructor is saying. Uh, I'm not going to become a jerk and challenge everything they're saying. I'm just going to take that information in, and I'm going to practice it, and I'm going to work on it and see if I can develop my own expression of it. So in the beginning, when you first sign up in a martial arts studio, yeah, you need to be taken through the ABCs. There's a correct way to punch and there's an incorrect way to punch. There's a, you know, like there, you need the basics. But from there, at that point, you now are in a place where you should be able to express martial arts in the way that a dancer is able to express themselves in a completely unique way because that's where you get the geniuses. That's where you get the, the, the music and the paintings and the art and the great things that contribute to culture and to the world is you get somebody that was able to do all that and then bring their own unique flavor to it. So that's what I believe it should be. That's what I've tried to do. I've trained a lot of martial arts styles throughout my life. Um, I do have degrees in a lot. I've got black belts in multiple disciplines, but I don't even care. Like uh, belts are just there to hold your pants together and your gi together. You know, like they're not, I, I, it just, it doesn't matter. I'm a martial artist. I'll be a martial artist till I'm dead. And I'm constantly a student in this art, you know? Yeah. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And what, how are you, um, how are you teaching martial arts and do you have a facility or are you doing it mobile or what does that look like? Yeah, I do teach. I did run my own professional facility for eight years. Um, I managed uh, multiple dojos prior to that and worked in under different schools and stuff. But now uh, I, it's just it's a really tough business and um, I, I didn't want my passion to get sucked out of it uh, by doing it under that model. So my wife and I, we got creative. And we created a sort of mobile concept. Um, and right now I do teach regularly out of a local gym in the community that I live. Um, I just, I go there a couple times a week. I run classes for kids, for teens, for adults. Uh, my wife does a, a women's only martial art program as well. And we just kind of go in and we, we do our thing. Um, and then we also go into schools. We go into professional corporate uh, environments. We do workshops. People hire me. You know, sometimes I travel different parts of the world and we do workshops and things like that. And I love that I can go and teach not even not just like uh, some physical training, which I love teaching that part, you know, but I love that I can also bring a lot of the philosophy and the deep thinking um, of it, too. So that's that's really how I do it. I'm pretty open, open book on on that front. Yeah, cool. And how um, how much of a. Um of a role does um, health play maybe in your teachings, um, like eating a healthy diet and that kind of thing. So I, I noticed that you mentioned um, in the Free Your Mind conference talk, um, I think it was Health Warrior. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks for about? bringing that up. Yeah, that's, so that that's actually my, my wife and I do, we work from home, we have our own home-based business. And there's a few, now that I'm an entrepreneur, I kind of dabble in a lot of projects, which is why I loved becoming an entrepreneur. It really freed me up so that I could kind of pursue my passions, right? But um, we established a, a home-based business where we do nutritional therapy for people. Um, we partner with a company that has incredible supplements and products and education on cellular health. And so what we do is we, uh, we go out, we, we help people like people that we're working with in the martial arts or in our community. Um, I even get people that contact me from all over the world. I have clients all over the world where I refer them to um, this information and to these types of products. And what it is, is it's a, it's a full range system for optimal health at the cellular level. And you know, all of your health starts at the cellular level. And what that means is what you're basically, it's as simple as this, what you're eating, what you're putting into your body uh, is definitely having an effect on your physical health and also your mental health as well. So when you're lacking or you're deficient in nutrients, whether they be, you know, the micronutrients, macronutrients, antioxidant protection of the cells, etc., cetera, um, you're, if you're not, if you're deficient in those things and your pH balance is thrown off, and we were just talking about balance and how important that is. And then your body can't perform the way it was designed to perform. 
See, human beings were actually designed to live for about 120 years. A lot of people don't really think about that. But if you really look at all the other species and you kind of calculate lifespans and all that kind of stuff, um, and you look at human genetics and you look at these things, even though we're dying at 70 and 60 and sometimes we get to 100, um, 120 is really the real uh, age that we should be potentially able to, to make it to if a lot of conditions are met. Um, and so like I, my, my great grandmother, she lived to be 106. Um, my grandma right now is in her nineties and she's still traveling the world, going to operas and going on the subway in Toronto and doing all this <laughs> stuff. She's still running around. Um, and it's funny because, uh, when, when it, when it comes to something like martial arts, I deal with athletes as well. And they want to go out and they're doing all the training. They're doing all the push ups, they're doing all the sparring they need to do. And then they go out and they compete on the day and they're flat. And they just, it's been, I'm like, I've had, I've had guys and I'm like, dude, what did you eat? Like, are you eating? What are you eating? And they're like, oh, I just went and grabbed some Tim Hortons this morning, you know? And I'm like, are you freaking crazy? <laughs> you fuel in your tank, man. Like go drive your car, go buy yourself a nice new Lamborghini and uh, don't put any gas in it and just see how far you go. You know what I mean? Yeah. So look at your body like that Lamborghini and put some friggin' fuel in there that it's actually going to be uh, efficient. And um, so basically... Uh, we look at, okay, there's only so much you can get anymore from food. So you get as much as you possibly can from food. You try to get organic. You try to get locally sourced things. You try to eat a well-balanced diet, getting all the ingredients you need. But because of the fact that um, our soil samples have been reduced or our, the soil samples we've been taking, there's been studies done for a long period of time that, that we're very deficient in minerals in the soil. Um, we're at about an 80-something percent. That's, that's up to the 80 percent of reduction in minerals in the soil and, and that's across the west you know so we're basically in a position where even if you're getting organic you're not getting what your great grandparents used to get so we're seeing an uptick in, in all kinds of uh, diseases and degenerative diseases and you know everybody's on the verge of type 2 diabetes and cancers and all these kinds of things and there's many reasons why um, but one of the reasons and one of the things you can do to combat that and change that dynamic is to really take control of your health. And that's why I recommend high quality supplements that are actually bioavailable um, that give you maybe the top up of what you might be missing. And then in, in working with that, you also on top of that, you need your kale salads, you need your the right kind of um, water, making sure you're drinking clean drinking water um, and drinking enough of it per day, making sure you're eating lots of fruits and vegetables and, you know, just the stuff we've been hearing about from grandma since we were kids, right? So we're just trying to help give people plans with that, motivate them, um, track their results so that they're like, oh, wow, I'm not just changing my diet uh, to, to something for nothing. I'm actually seeing incredible amounts of energy, sleeping better, which means I'm performing better, which means I'm accessing my potential at a faster rate because I'm not all blocked up and toxic anymore. Um, remember how we were talking about polishing that prism, you know, that's what it's all about. So the body, the health of the body, that's the soil and it needs good fertilization and it needs to be watered and, nu and nurtured and get enough sunlight, you know, so don't neglect your physical health. If you're suffering from mental health issues, focus on your physical health and see how things go because that's usually one of the biggest contributing factors is that somewhere you are deficient with something. So that's what we try to do is help people learn about that. Awesome. That's great work. Really like that. Um, so there's a couple of questions I like to ask people um, in, the, in my interviews. And the first one is um, what would be your best tip for people looking to lift their level of consciousness today? I would say start by listening to this podcast. Uh, from the no, <laughs> I would say, yeah, uh, go on a journey of learning something new. Like think of something that you're passionate about, okay? So everybody out there listening, maybe it's not martial arts. I just talk martial arts because that's what I love. That's what I'm switched on to. But I mean, think about it. All knowledge is ultimately self-knowledge, is it not? So everything you're learning about, if you, I don't care what it is, maybe you want to learn about engineering or architectural design or uh, you want to learn about health or you want to learn about quantum physics, I don't know, whatever it is that you're inspired to learn about or a new musical instrument, um, go and do it. What are you waiting for? Why are you sitting there waiting? Why are you sitting there only watching other people do it? You know, we get to watch television all the time and follow our favorite celebrities and we see people doing things that we wish we could do and then we don't do it, you know, so go do it. Just jump into it. Just start. 
If you wanted to, op- you want to start becoming an entrepreneur and working for yourself, see how you can create something that's yours and feel more productive. That's a huge step. Or if you're, if you are, you love your job, then how can you be more effective at the job that you're doing? How can the work that you do, whether you're at work or at home, how can it touch somebody else's life? And how can it enhance your life? Uh, start with the basics and start to connect to what it is that makes you really passionate. Like I have a friend of mine that he, if he can get on his mountain bike, he's in heaven. He just mountain biking for him, especially where I live. It's just so beautiful in British Columbia. You know, you get on your Mike mountain bike and he just, he's the kind of guy that'll go for days. He'd, he'd go like camping on his mountain bike, you know, and that's his passion. And that's one of his outlets. And he feels like he's connecting to nature and, uh, he, that that's good for him. So think about what's that for you? You, you like putting on ice skates, you know, think about those things and then read the greats, read the greats. There are brilliant minds that have contributed to human culture and human p- development for thousands and thousands of years, going back to the Greek philosophers, or you can read people, you know, that were writing stuff since back to Samaria and ancient Egypt, and you can follow it all the way through. And there's been so many great scholars and writers, and you can learn so much about life and about about the real self and who you are, um, get into reading. And if you could read 15 minutes a day for 365 days, you'd be surprised how many books you could actually get through if you did 15 minutes a day and you committed to it without any kind of compromise. 15 minutes a day. And is that too much to ask? It's probably going to give you a little break from all the noise in your head for a while. Um, Or listen to a podcast for... 15 minutes, you know, although you should probably listen to the whole thing, but you know, <laughs> bite sizes um, that, that you feel is, is, and what kind of podcast is it? What kind of movie are you watching? What kind of TV show are you exposing your mind to every day? Think about instead of just eating it because it's entertaining or eating it because it tastes good, start to do things that are actually good and see how you feel. Um, and I just, I've known from my own experience and from working with so many people that when they make those little tiny adjustments, Man, their consciousness sure does expand in a really incredible way. Awesome. Great advice. Thank you. And secondly, what uh, would be your best advice on how people can contribute to the rise of humanity? Do the first step. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's that's good it. <laughs> Think about it. Like, I mean, you know, what is humanity? What, uh, humanity isn't just this Borg-like uh, goop of one thing. It's, a, it's an incredible, diverse uh, mix of all kinds of different expressions of um, of the universe and of nature and of God or whatever word you want to use. So if you want to change the world, you don't go running around trying to change the world. That's the last thing I would advise you to do. And I think that's what happens to a lot of people is they start making signs and going protesting and doing all that and fine, that's great, but um, it hasn't changed the world yet. So in order to change the world, you have to start with each individual that makes up the society that you're trying to change. Um, Because if you can't have an empowered population of people that uh, are healthy, that are vibrant, that are switched on, that are knowledgeable, that are watching their politicians like hawks, that are, um, you know, standing up for justice, that are uh, and and, and standing up for justice, not just for the, the whole world or some continent you've never visited, but standing up for justice in your own life and in your own neighborhood with the people you see every single day. Start there. Like, how could you expect to go out and change the entire world um, by yourself? You need to go and change your world first, and then it will create that morphogenic response and uh it'll be it'll be something that'll be contagious that's what i've seen so start with you wonderful absolutely completely agree um so uh david where can we find out more about you uh your work truth warrior health warrior your video logs that sort of stuff well i'm currently on so today's uh, tuesday october 10th 2017 so today my website is off because i'm uh, it's offline because i'm rebuilding it i want to be at, i want to add some more features and content uh, so it's it's offline for the next week or two but you can go and uh, check me out on youtube just go look up my name david whitehead or look up truth warrior you'll definitely find me there subscribe check out my videos give me your fair feedback um, please share you know help me get the word out of what i'm doing and then only if you like it, of course. If you don't like it, just you know, unsubscribe. But then uh, go and check me out over at iTunes. I also have my uh, MP3s are on iTunes, and I'm also on Podbean, P-O-D-B-E-A-N dot com. They have a great podcasting platform, so you can check me out there as well. Um, my Health Warrior website 
Uh, it was linked to my Truthware website, but it's uh, it's healthwarrior.usana.com. And my wife and I run that site. But uh, yeah, you'll be able to find everything through even just my YouTube channel. Cool. Thank you. So uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. It's been a great conversation. So, so thank you uh, for coming on and sharing all your knowledge and wisdom today. Well, thanks, Chris. It's been a great conversation. Love your show. Keep up what you're doing. And thanks to all the listeners for sticking with us right to the end here. Appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you, David. So that is all for today, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Rise of Humanity and have found some very useful information to take away to use uh, to improve your life and uh, impact the world in a better way. So I'll catch you all next time. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. Bye bye.